So this triple conference, the concept was, or the concept is, because it's still going, to bring together different ideas and different conferences that might challenge you. There are people who would say, well, I'd, I'd happily come to the Church and State Conference, but I'm not really interested in the other ones. Or I'm, I'd have, happily come to the Friedman Conference, but I'm, I couldn't really care about Church and State. And because I frequent political conferences, because I'm weird, I happen to know that there's a lot in all of these conferences that I think a lot of people should be listening to, and that we should all be listening to ideas that challenge us a lot more than most of us are in the habit of doing. And so... I had this idea some years ago originally, and I, I chatted about it with a few different people back and forth, and then all of a sudden, very late last year, we had the opportunity to actually put it together, and it was only in January that we actually confirmed that we were going to go ahead with this crazy idea called the Triple Conference. And I've enjoyed incredible support from Dave Pello from Church and State, from John Humphreys from, uh, from the, the Friedman Conference, uh, and the team behind the Big Ideas for a Better Australia concept, which is now uh, the third day. That's tomorrow, Big Ideas for a Better Australia. It's tomorrow, but it's also the theme. We've had some big ideas already. Certainly, David Landini's Riverina State last night, and certainly some big ideas being discussed all the way through today. So it's been my absolute pri privilege and honour to be your MC yesterday and today, and uh, the Church and State Conference is now in its final session. I know, right? However, the good news is we're about to put on stage four fantastic speakers that you've heard from already, but this time they're going to get to, uh, you know that, that verse about iron sharpens iron? They're going to get to bounce off each other. Instead of talking one after the other, they're going to be sitting there and talking amongst themselves, and we get the privilege of being a fly on the wall while these four incredible men have an incredible conversation for the next hour or so. So the way this is going to work is I'm going to hand over shortly uh, to Dave. Actually, I'll, I'll bring everyone up on stage in a moment. I'll hand it all over to Dave. And then uh, at the conclusion, once I've finished waving my arms like a madman with various numbers of fingers extended and we finally get down to zero, uh, Dave's then going to give us some closing remarks to close the church and state part of the conference. Uh, and then I'll come up briefly just to, to close today from the triple conference perspective and give you information about tonight for those that are coming to the gala. Alrighty, some people have filtered in. We've got a, uh, there must still be half the crowd must still be over there enjoying each other's company, but we're going to enjoy the company of Pastor Matthew Littlefield, Dr. Stephen Shavira, Graham Hood, and of course, Dave Pello. Coming up, gentlemen. people up in the dress circle. Hello. Are we live? We are. Testing. Cool. Right. How then shall we live? Good question. Um, you know what? I reckon there's going to be two ways to answer this. Um, how then shall we live if we're not Christians? And of course, how then shall we live if we are? Um, Hoodie, have you got any... Let, let, me, let me even ask you a question to, to kick us off and stimulate the conversation. So you're going to have a, a lot of people in in your fan base and, and audience who are not churchgoers. Um, how do you think they can apply the principles and, and teachings of, of what we've heard today? Well, I think for me, the, the biggest example of that is how they you know why are they why are they listening to what I've got to, got to say and and I've been blown away by the number of people who prefix a comment to me by saying look I don't believe in God I'm an atheist but can you pray for me um, <laughs> and uh, I don't believe in God but if you don't pray at the end of your program I can't go to sleep at night and I say to them uh, what do you think God's trying to tell you and they'll say well I don't know I'm trying to work that out well, he's already told you one thing, you're no longer an atheist because the God you don't believe in is the one you're waiting to tell you what you need to hear. Um, for me, living with compassion is everything and if we're not doing it for compassion, we're not doing it for love, then we're not doing it for the right reasons. And where people go on their journey with that is up to them. But I think it beholds all of us who are Christians now more than ever 
to recognise that there's so much low-hanging fruit out there. When an atheist comes up and wants a hug and he's crying and he wants you to pray for him, that's telling us something. So we have, all of us who believe in God, have an awesome responsibility. And so for me, living into that is just being who I am. Um, 20 years ago, you talk about a fan base, I'm not, I don't much like that term, but um, if I had the people following me that I have now, my ego would have exploded. And I'm so grateful to God that it isn't because every day I, I uh, feel more and more humble and every day I feel like, um, please don't say something nice about me because I don't know that I can handle it. But I'm actually, I just reflect that straight up to God. And a lot of people have said to me, whatever you do, don't pray and don't mention God, especially at the rallies. And if you stop praying and mentioning God, you'd have a bigger following. Well, I don't care. And it seems neither do they, because the more humble I try to be... No, I don't try to be. I don't try to be. That's a stupid thing to say. I want the Holy Spirit to be my behaviour mechanisms for me. And the more humble that makes me appear, it seems like the following gets bigger. So, I don't know, we've just got to live in truth. That's, that's the only way we're going to get through this. And I've learned, I've learned um, that it's a lot easier to love somebody than it is to like them. And because what we don't like about people is their behaviour. But we don't know the pain that underscores that. We heard Monica's testimony. We heard Crystal's testimony. Yeah, Monica may well have been judged by some because of what she admitted that, that she had done. But we don't know the pain that underscores that. And when we, when we judge people and condemn them because of their behaviour, we're actually doing... God's job, not God's work. So I don't know whether that answered the question. It sounded good. <laughs> sounded great. Well, so let's just go left to right. Um, I, I think how then shall we live? Um, I, I think I like the word you used, and that is truth. Um, I think we have to live truly. And we have to work with the principle that truth isn't subjective. It's not something we can own. It's not something we can influence or change, uh, such as gender. Uh, it, it's not something you get a vote on. Um, it's, it's as real and unavoidable as a concrete barrier on the freeway. If you're doing 100 miles an hour, you'd better cooperate with it because resisting it's not going to end well. Um, it's, it's, we're going to come up hard against truth if we, if we try and fight it. Um, and so how does that, what does that actually mean? Um, I, I don't know, but I think, I think there's a degree of humility that's important when we, when we work with the idea that there's no such thing as your truth. Um, in, in fact, um, Senator Roberts, um, talks often about the importance of science, but I, I, th I think science is a method as opposed to an answer. And I think uh, the, the purpose of science is the same as the purpose of free speech. And both can be abused by people with evil agendas. Um, the purpose of both is truth. And so if truth is our objective, when, when now submitted to and subservient to truth and discovering truth and making truth known. And it's humbling to admit there's something that you can't change but you can discover. Uh, and it's also liberating because it means uh, you're not responsible for the answer. It, God is responsible for the answer or however you want to, to therefore work. And so um, what it what it implies what it in requires of us then is a, a intentional response every day. If there is truth, how do I respond to lies and falsehood and deception? How do I respond to the manipulation of things like science and freedom of speech and any other freedom? Because freedoms can be abused just the same as science can be abused and they shouldn't be. Oh, well, that's a little bit of waffling from me. Your turn. 
Thank you. I have no idea what I'm supposed to be how responding to. How then shall here. we live? How then shall we live? Well, um, I like, actually liked a lot of what you said. I mean, how then shall we live? One of my favorite passages in the Bible uh, is right at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. The final verses, and I'll, I'll paraphrase, and, and to me, this is really sort of the meaning of life. And um, fear God, obey his commands, for this is the whole duty of man. To me, that's really what it's all about. Uh, I liked what you said about humility, and, I'll, I'll, and look, I think actually science at its best, humility is built into science. If I was to think of what the scientific method is, it's to uh, pursue truth publicly in such a way that you invite uh, good faith attempts to falsify everything you have just suggested, and that's sort of sort of Karl Popper's definition of what sort of the, 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 sort of the process of science is all about. It's sort of putting forward an hypothesis and testing it, but then inviting everyone else to prove me that I'm wrong. Um, I don't necessarily want to be right. I'm happy to be wrong if we come closer to the truth. And in some ways, um, the, pursuit, the pursuit of truth done on one's own that is when arrogance comes in. The pursuit of truth is always best done in community. It's always best done with other people who can hold you accountable to the things that you say. And, and that the arrogant people tend to be those who sit on their own, reading scripture, just getting, just sort of more sort of reading into scripture what they want to see in it, not listening to other people, not reading scripture in a community of people reading with them and disagreeing on a whole bunch of things. And, and then such people, after they're finished, they're convinced that they have the monopoly of the meaning of scripture and then they go out and tell everyone else how wrong they are. Now, in actual fact, I think that that's the vast minority of Christians. I think, in actual fact, the overwhelming majority of Christians I've ever known are actually humble and they try to understand scripture in the context of a community and, and people well qualified to understand the Bible. Uh, and so they don't get carried away by reading into the Bible rather than uh, reading out of the Bible. But in terms of how shall we live, I'll just very quickly. I think the, the, sort of the, the great imperative for Christians to be involved in, peri, uh, in politics uh, comes from what Jesus summarizes as the second great commandment. Uh, love your neighbor as, your, as yourself. It's all about loving others and loving the community. And that's why I'm actually not a great fan of Christians talking about our rights. I actually don't think the Bible is a my rights book. I actually don't think the Bible is a rights book, to be honest. I think the Bible is a what are my duties to, my, to, to God and my fellow humankind book. And so if there is an imperative for Christians to be involved in politics, it is because it is often, at, at the macro level, it's the most powerful way to love and serve your neighbours. Yes, you can give your neighbour a hot meal when they're struggling to be able to meet their grocery bills that week, or you can go, or and or, you can go into politics and you can make sure that we have an economy that ensures that that person's going to have a job that allows them to be able to buy things for themselves. That's how I understand the how then shall we live. I think these guys have said some great stuff. I'll just add a couple of things. One of the reasons the left has been so successful uh, is collective action and a long-term goal. They haven't tried to change society in a generation. I mean, I've done extensive writings on this. You can go back to movements 150 years ago, even earlier, where they're looking at the vision they want to have for society and they've just progressively moved towards it, but they've, they've gathered with like-minded people and they've put that into practice. And I think as Christ, if you're a Christian here today, you know what the scripture says about how to live, you know what the Bible says, and, uh, and what these guys have shared is really good, and we, you can build on what they've said. And I would just add, uh, add to that, you need to be deliberate about getting together with like-minded people uh, and have a, a biblical goal for what you want society to work towards, and then get involved in stuff which helps to achieve that. Uh, I like to use examples. Uh, who's the 
best rugby league player. I mean, this is I'm probably in AFL country here, but I'll butcher it if I try and talk about AFL players. I, 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 I don't know any of them at the moment. But the best rugby league player, I don't know, who would it be? You could think of someone like Caelan Ponger, or maybe it's Cameron Munster, who's on the, the Melbourne Storm. How good is he at beating any other player on the field? Really good. What would happen to him if you put him against the whole team by himself? They'd make mincemeat of him. And the right, that's exactly how we tackle the left. And so when it comes to how we should live, we actually have to be more collective in the way we do it, not be so atomized, and take all these things that we've got and put them together into actual, we get alongside, and this is a good example of doing that. Uh, I, I, there's a barbecue I go to quite regularly. I get around like-minded people who encourage you. Then through those connections, you meet people that you can get involved in political stuff or church stuff. And then with that practical gathering together, you actually become far more powerful. So there's all the individual stuff we need to do, but then there's how do we actually make it successful? And that comes through working with others. Uh, one of the most important principles in life, and you've all heard it, it's not what you know. What is it? You know that's the way the universe was created to exist? How do you get into, into heaven? Is it what you know? Or is it who you know? The whole universe is designed on that principle. Yet we forget it. And so if we put that... And I've found by getting alongside people with... And when I say like-minded, I do not mean agreeing on everything. We're never going to agree on everything but on the main things and collectively working together on those and looking towards the future and saying in 10, 20, 30 years, this is what I want my family to look like, my church to look like, my community to look like, my nation to look like and getting around people that want to work on that with you. So I want to pick up on something you said and, and we may agree furiously and, Stephen, um, you, you said the Bible's not a book about my rights, and and I agree in that much, but I do think it's a book of rights. I think it's actually me, it's a book about your rights from my perspective. What do I care about you, my neighbour, what you're entitled to? Uh, a better way of articulating this might be, what has got God got planned for you? What's his best for you? Uh, so the founding fathers of America talked about inalienable rights. And I heard that defined recently as rights that no one has an authority to take away from you and you have no authority to give away. A really easy example would be slavery. Understanding the God-given right of free will, uh, no one has the right to take that away from you, and you don't have the right to give it up. You can't voluntarily become a slave. I think everybody in the room can agree that's, that's a good truth, whether you're a believer or not. And, and so I think there is, it's probably blunt language to, to call it a, a book about rights, um, but I think it is a book about design. Uh, and that includes uh, the four levels of God-ordained government, self-government, family government, church, government, and civil government. And there are boundaries and realms where each of those can uh, operate, and they shouldn't transgress those boundaries. And so as to the question of how then shall we live, I, obviously there's a strong um, current of libertarian sentiment in the room, and I don't try to be libertarian or conservative, but if how I choose to identify is relevant. I choose to calibrate and identify to Christ. And, and however I coincidentally end up in another box, I'm not resistant to. But I think in sympathy with libertarian sentiments, you're a better libertarian if you're a Christian. Because big family and big church is the antidote to over-government. The abdication of family government and the abdication of church government, the, the things that the, the church has been given God, by God to um, communicate and articulate truth and, and justice about, that overinflates and overfeeds government to be invasive. 
I, I, I compare government. I grew up in country New South Wales, and uh, in those days, blackberry bushes were plague. Now, I like blackberry jam. God created blackberries, but they should be contained to an area and not allowed to take over paddocks where they then suffocate with their thorns and, and make other uses and experiences of, of that paddock enjoyable, very much like government. It should be pruned regularly and kept small, and the fruits will be enjoyable, but they can grow too far. Amen. And, and so how then shall we live? I think we need a reformation in family. If we had much bigger family, there'd be much less need for childcare and much less need for aged care. I don't like nuclear families. I like the Asian standard of multi-generational households. And God's design, again, is for church community to be the next level of safety net, not welfare. But that when my family is either dysfunctional or, or there's death or other things that have reduced my family's ability to care for me, either as a child or as a senior, then the church community is God's next plan for charity. And that isn't something to be despised because it's just the Christian word for love. You're not doing it out of pity, you're doing it out of community. Um, and it's an opportunity to express love when somebody in your life needs that. Um, and, and without going too much into a, a tangent there, let me just summarise what I'm saying. Is, is God's designed things for us. And you could express it with the language of rights, parental rights, um, church rights. How dare government tell us to close the door of church and refuse people fellowship, worship and communion? How dare they? But I'm concerned with the rights of people to come and seek that because God said that's how we should live. And how dare government tell me that I can't counsel my children that perverse confusions are destructive to them. How dare they transgress parental rights? And so I'm concerned about you and your parental rights and your rights to attend a church on Sunday during an epidemic uh, because that's how God said we should live. And that doesn't mean we divorce ourselves from wisdom, but it does mean that God's plan for how we should live is a necessary limitation on the abuse of, of power and of government. Anyone want to develop on those thoughts? Maybe you, Stephen, have, well, have I taken too much into your uh, choice of words? Well, I'm going to just uh, kind of disagree. I mean, disagreement is nice, so here we go. I think rights language is just too often leads to selfishness, um, excessive individualism. And I maintain that the Bible is not a rights book, it's a duties book. Um, I like the idea of parental rights. I like even better the idea of parental duties. Because if, you know, educating your children is your right, then a right also by definition is something you can relinquish. But you can't just relinquish your duties. What do I mean by that? I have a right to the change when I buy something. That's my right. Uh, the person who gives me the change has a duty to give it to me. I can relinquish my right and say, keep the change. They can't relinquish their duty and say, I'll keep the change. So duties are actually much stronger than rights. Now, I do think we have rights. I honestly do. The very fact that we are able to forgive people means that something of ours has been violated. I do believe we have rights. I don't think we have nearly as many rights as people think we do. But I actually think that, that Christians are duty people, not rights people. Um, and I forgot what I was going to say, but that's good because I want to hear from these other people. So. I agree, that's important nuance. That's good, Stephen. I, I actually think uh, both these views can be melded. Uh, and I'm not just saying that to be conciliatory. I think we've got an individual thing and a social thing here. I think Stephen is 100% correct. At an individual level, the Bible is about our responsibilities. It's our responsibility to follow God, our responsibility to obey His laws, our responsibility to repent for our sins, our, our responsibility to love our neighbor. That is our duty. But there's also a collective social level. It says in many parts of the prophets, you have deprived the poor of their right. And what's that referring to? It's referring back to the Old Testament laws where the rights and privileges and responsibilities of the nation of Israel were outlined. 
And so when we're looking at, because we, 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 we tend to lean towards sort of the conservative side or the right side of politics, we tend to be individualistically minded in how we look at all this. But when you see there's an individualistic concept, but also a social concept, and the social concept, like, a, a, for example, a king or a prime minister, he's not responsible to just do his duty, is he? He's also responsible, or well, part of his duty is to make sure that your rights are protected. When King David took Uriah's wife, he stealed, he committed adultery. He also deprived Uriah of his right to not have his wife stolen. So there's an individual aspect, but also the social aspect. And I think the Bible speaks to both. But on a personal level, which I think is what Stephen's talking to, our responsibility should be more thinking less about what we can get in this world. Uh, who was it? Uh, Je it? Was John F. Kennedy Jr.? Think not what you, your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I mean, to quote one of the great sayings, I think that's what you're saying, isn't it, Stephen? Yes, but I also thought, think when we talk about other people's rights, we corrupt them. That's just to throw a Spaniard in the works. <laughs> Yeah, look, where, where, where all of that started to fall down was where the, the way the government used it, in particular in Victoria. In fact, the narrative used it around the world. Your rights to bodily autonomy should not overtake the rights of those who want to be protected by everybody getting vaccinated. I don't know whether I put that the right way or not. Yeah, but, um, you know, we've, we've still got to come back to basics. But the question of how then should we live, I think we, we really need to start focusing on how then should our children live. Um, and that's what really scares me because I've seen, I've seen a lot of uh, the left really push um, and left, right, who cares? Look, I've never flown an aeroplane that didn't fly well unless it had a left wing and a right wing. Um, I sit in the middle and say to most people, I, I just like to see the value in either side. But, but um, what, what we've noticed is, is the fact that children are actually being guided by the left to take over the rights of the parents. The rights of the parents over their children is stolen from them, often by their children who've been educated through indoctrination at schools to do that. For example, um, the greatest gift you can give your children is a happy marriage. Yes. Yeah. One of the biggest destroyers of a happy marriage is children who get everything that they want at the expense of the parents. So we also model marriage to our children. What our children see in the way that we live is what they take into their future. So we have a situation now. I flew with a young, a young co-pilot once and I said, I've never flown with him before. And when we got up into the cruise, I said, so tell me, Paul, what do you do for fun? I don't have fun. I've got kids. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, I spend my whole life working overtime to pay for the iPad, the public school, the da-da-da-da-da-da-da. He said, I don't have fun. I don't get a chance to do anything I want to do for me. And I said, why do you do that? He said, because that's what they expect. I said, who are your children? He said, no, they. I said, who's they? He said, society. I said, have you asked your children what they expect of you? No. I said, let me give you an example. Let's say that I offered you a, a gift, a, a choice of two gifts, a box in the left hand, a box in the right hand. In the left hand is mum and dad's got lots of money. There's a couple of BMWs parked in the driveway. Uh, we go to the best public school. We go to LA to... Uh, for Christmas holidays to go to Disneyland and um, we've got everything we need and everything we want, which is often different to what we need, and Dad's in my life 37 seconds a day. Why did I choose 37 seconds? Because in accordance with statistics in 2001, the average time spent with... A father spent 37 seconds a day in one-on-one -on -one communication with each of his children. That's it. So by the time your child is six years old, the television will have spoken to him more in that six years than you will in his entire lifetime. Now that bears thinking about. That's really scary. So David Koch and all these other people or whoever else, Taylor Swift and all that, they're all influencing our kids when we should be. We've abrogated that responsibility. In the other hand, you've got a box that has mum and dad live in an average house. Uh, they've got a couple of old... Uh, cars in the driveway, 10-year-old cars. We've got one uh, PC computer on the desk at home. We go to a good public school. We go to Port Macquarie for our holidays every year. And Dad's in our life four hours a day. And I said to Paul, which box do you reckon the kids would take? 
He said, the one you just said. I said, so why don't you offer it to them? Why don't you ask them what they want? But here's the trick. We have to offer that to our kids before they get to 12 years old. Because after 12 years old, it's too late. If you go to your child after being a dad that's provided everything, everything they want, rather than giving them everything they need, by the time they get to 12 years old and you say, listen, Johnny, I've decided I'm going to change things around. We're not going to have all the trappings anymore. We're going to downsize. I'm going to keep things simple. I'm going to be in your life four hours a day. He's going to give you the raw salute. Why? Because by then he's already hating you. Having you in my life 37 seconds a day is bad enough without having you four hours a day. You just keep working and I'll keep raking in what I want. They're the things we have to change. We can, we can sit here and talk about all these things as adults, but there's a whole bunch of young people who should be here that aren't. And we've got to start changing our attitude towards the way we raise our kids. Because when the best gift you can give your children is a happy marriage, when mum and dad are happy, the kids are happy because they feel secure. Amen. That's the truth of it. When mum and dad are happy. Now, in order to be happy, you have to meet the emotional needs of each parent. Each parent has to look after itself, the other one. You have to watch each other's back. And the kids should be there as an accessory to a good marriage. Not the way we see things now. They're the things that we have to change if we're talking about living a better life. It's so true. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it is so true. And it, we, one of the things that we should be trying really hard and really intentionally to do is to shed ourselves of unnecessary debt, unnecessary expenses, unnecessary activities, which just... One of, the, one of the things, I was talking about this was, actually I've talked about it with a lot of people recently. One of the most common things when you ask people how they're doing, one of the most common things people say, what do they say? Oh, I'm busy. It's, 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 like, it's like the, uh, the middle class uh, virtue signal. And if they're not busy, they feel bad. Uh, and why are we busy? Because we're chasing everything that we think we should have. But many years ago, my wife and I, we decided we did not want to do that. We decided we wanted to live simply. Uh, we live in an old house with a small mortgage, deliberately, so that we can live a much simpler life. Uh, because of what Graham is saying, it's absolutely correct. And if, if you want to stand against the system when it starts to get coercive, if you're in your eyeballs with debt and all this other stuff, and I'm not saying you can't have any, I'm just saying if you've got all this over your head, which you, if you just take a, uh, if, you, if your job is under threat, you lose it, you lose everything, and you're in that much stress, how likely are you going to be able to stand? So if we're living simpler in our day-to-day -day life, and you know, one of the things that Graham just said there is so true, you know, do you think your kid wants all these fancy things or time with their parents? I, I love that I've got time you know, in afternoons to play uh, Xbox with my son or go for a walk with my daughter. Uh, take, we just got a new puppy recently. She loves to take him for a walk. Uh, you know, and a lot of parents do this stuff. I'm not saying that they don't. But more and more, we're trying to chase what other people have. And the more you do that, the less time you'll have for the important things. And also, the more likely you are to put yourself in a position where they've got you over a barrel. And then when the time to stand comes and you risk losing everything, it's really hard. And I get it. That's a lot of stress. I remember counseling people in 2020, 2021, 2022. I don't want to get this, man. I don't want to get this. I don't want to get this. But I'm in so much debt. And I said, I understand. I didn't judge them. I felt for them. I felt for everyone who was forced to make the decision. They were put in a position they never should have been put in. But one of the, we can't control always what the government's going to do. We can control our exposure to a degree. And that's not going to be the same for everyone. And by nature of your profession, sometimes you'll just be more exposed than others. And there's, in such, there's a degree to which we can't avoid that. We live in a society, as George Costanza would often say. We try to live in a society here. Anyway, but there's a degree to which we are all going to be exposed in our society. But we can, if we limit that in practical ways, and listen to what Graham just said there. I can't say amen enough to what he's just said. Agreed. You know, Stephen, I'm, I'm coming around hard to your, your nuances and, and pedantics over the semantics. If the question was, how then should we govern, I would fight longer. Because I think we can derive clear rights from Scripture. 
But the question is, how then shall we live? And I think it is incumbent upon us to stop thinking of life as a consumer product and start thinking of it as an obligation and an opportunity for a legacy to make the world better. And you can derive from Scripture, how then shall we leave the world? How then shall we leave our families? I'm convinced, and, and I'm not, I couldn't give you a specific verse on this, but I, I think it harmonises with Scripture that, that when I get to heaven, God's not going to say to me, well, Dave, how's your Facebook audience? <laughs> or, hey, Dave, how's your, your click-through rate? Or how big's your ministry? The first question God's going to ask me when I get to heaven, I believe, is, hey, Dave, how's your wife? And the next question is, hey, Dave, how's your kids? And if I can't answer, I've done my best, I've followed your wisdom, your truth, and with all humility, I've tried to fix it when I've stuffed up, he's not going to care about the answer to, how's the ministry I gave you and the mission in this world? I've got to get those things right. That's my duty. And then getting those things right. I've got the, the, the duties on... How's your church? How's your city? How's your nation? And how are the people overseas? There's perhaps, I think you can certainly derive from Scripture, concentric circles of responsibility. Um, in Scripture it says, he who fails to care for his own household is worse than an unbeliever. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, um, yeah, I'm coming around fast to your uh, emphasis. You've just seen reason in action, ladies and gentlemen. Give him a hand. <laughs> uh, sort of, I was just reflecting on what the three of you gentlemen were saying, and I, it seems to me we can distinguish between uh, sort of how shall we live positively and how shall we live negatively. Positively, how shall we live? And this is by no means an exhaustive list, but here we go. Marry, have children, live within your means. Keep your children from corruption. Serve your community. Look after your parents. Stay fit. Exercise self-control. Don't be addicted to screens and porn. Worship God. That's positively. Negatively, destroy everything that seeks to get in the way of those positive goals. And that's what we want to do as individuals, and that's what any government should be doing. Thanks for coming. That's it. You know, the, um, there's a great book that was published in uh, Australia, I think about 2002, it was called Affluenza. Anyone read it? An amazing book by two uh, Australian economists. And uh, I'm probably, I'll paraphrase as much as I can, but there's one chapter of the book that relates to where they spent six months um, uh, running a survey of people that walked through the Burke Street Mall. And the survey was, that there was two questions. Do you have enough in life to sustain your basic needs? The second question was, what is it that you can't afford? So the first answer was, they got about 78% of people said, no, I don't get enough to meet my most basic needs. What is, the, what is the thing that you need most that you cannot afford? The top answer was a flat screen TV. So these, this consumerism that binds us also affects the way that we live throughout our marriages, throughout our communities, where we've got to try and have better things than other people. So um, there's, there's a lot of stuff we've got to change, I guess, is how do we change it? And that's by living by example. I don't know. Well, something that Matthew has spoken a lot about over the years, and I'm very concerned with, and, and something that sort of looms in the background of a lot of this, and maybe this will be a topic of the next conference, but... Marry, have children, live close to and be able to look after your parents, live within your means. Uh, all made much harder by housing affordability these days. And so one of the... And Christians sometimes can become a little bit um, otherworldly in talking about problems of the world. I think it's always helpful to bring it back to some of just the, the brass tax things that are really afflicting society today. And one of them is just the cost of rent, the cost of buying a house... Uh, it's become so prohibitive that it's almost like the whole system is against people living a virtuous life now, Matthew. Oh, man, you just hit on one of my favourite topics. 
If you look at many of the ancient civilizations, say, civilizations like Babylon, Sumer, even ancient Greece and early Rome, all of these long-lasting, Byzantium, all of these long-lasting civilizations had a few things in common. One of the things that they all did was generational debt reset, debt forgiveness. And you can read, for example, a, a, a very prominent economist, Michael Hudson, who's gone through and written a fantastic book called And Forgive Them Their Debts. And you wouldn't believe what the, can you guess what the front of the cover is of this book? Okay, someone take a stab in the dark. I'll give you a clue. Toffer used it as a meme in his talk. Yeah, it's, it's Jesus. Who, what, whose tables was Jesus overturning? The bankers. Because what do, they, what do they do when they get unrestrained? They crush people. And they worked out many thousands of years ago, you, you can restrain both the debtor and the lender by just making periodic debt forgivenesses, which basically reset the economy and gave everybody a fighting chance. And when every single one of these civilizations stopped doing this, it was only within a few generations when they collapsed. And that has been documented throughout the history of all these civilizations. When Sparta, you know Sparta? Uh, you know, Spartacus. No, well, that's different, sorry. <laughs> Leonidas, sorry, Leonidas, the 300. When Sparta was founded, Solon, the founder of Sparta, one of the things that he did was wiped all debts and set everybody on an even footing. But over time, they forgot this. Sparta disappeared, it weakens the society because you get a very top-heavy society with a lot of poor people and very few rich people. And strangely enough, that's happening in our society. Who would have thunk it? Jubilee. Well, this yeah. is sounding like communism now. <laughs> well, I don't remember the, um, the communists writing the book of Leviticus. I don't remember, uh, you know, when Jesus got up and proclaimed the year of the Lord's favor in Luke chapter 4, he was referring to, if I remember correctly, Isaiah 61, which is referencing the year of Jubilee in the scriptures. And what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to give you the best Jubilee. And the best Jubilee is forgiveness of sins. What does God do? He wipes our slate clean. And all of the ancient civilizations understood. In fact, the reason why we use the words forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are in debt to us. The reason we use those words is because the concept of needing to reset society on occasion was understood long before the, uh, the Christian concept of sin was explained. The Christian concept of sin is building on that language, which is all through the scriptures. And there are incredible writings on this stuff. I recommend Michael Hudson and forgive them their debts. Uh, if we do not relieve burdens of people uh, on occasion, what happens is those burdens crush them. Let's just go... Um Maybe starting with you, Matt, fair warning, and we'll go left to right um, and take a one-minute summary of what we've said this afternoon and, and your takeaways for how then shall we live. Uh, as Christians, we have, and not just Christians, as Australians, as citizens, we have a responsibility to hand a better society than we inherited. That is our responsibility and if we don't do that, we've failed. This is for Christian and non-Christian. Uh, first thing is to realize that our, the culture around us is not like the air that we breathe. The air that we breathe is neutral and gives us sustenance and keeps us alive. The culture around us is really just trying to get us addicted to all sorts of things that put money in the pockets of global elites. So the first thing I would say is just realize that you are not in a neutral culture. You're in a culture that's trying to pull you away from something. Pull you away from what? An objective created order within which we are supposed to live in accordance with that will actually be conducive to our long-term happiness as human beings. Uh, that is precisely how we are to live. I might actually finish, let you go and then I'll wrap up. Um, for the whole day. We need another two hours because we haven't even discussed manhood in any of this 
and that's that's real. We've got to start from the patriarchy down. Men have been cancelled. We've got to restore manhood back to its rightful place. That's when women are at their rightful place, which is which is there with the with the husband. Uh, the Christian Church too often hangs on that verse of you know women are meant to be subservient to their husbands. It doesn't go to the next step, where the husbands are meant to love their wife as Christ loved the church and be prepared to die for her. Now, when a husband does that, then when a husband treats his wife like that, then that wife is really fulfilling what a woman is. Because I believe men were meant to be hunters, gatherers and protectors, and women were meant to be mothers, homemakers and nurturers, all equal but different, but blended together, make a beautiful unit that makes strong families. And I believe when we restore that, that's how we should live. I'm old-fashioned, forgive me. I'm sorry if I offended anybody, any feminists, but... Uh, that's why the left are associating cancellation of gender as, as much as they are. I think that's what we've got to focus on. So, in conclusion, church and state is, is about reclaiming the church's rightful and helpful place in a society which is expected to self-govern. And whether you've got a... Look, when you've got a, a corrupt king, it, it's bad for the city because his heart is corrupt. And when you've got a, a corrupt um, military dictatorship, um, it's corrupt because of those reasons. There have been many benevolent dictators in history and the lack of democracy wasn't bad for the society because... People were flourishing under a, a relatively just administration. And it's the same thing in democracy. If the hearts of the voters are corrupt and proud, then it would be bizarre to think there would be a different kind of parliament reflecting the voters. And so church has a very, very necessary place. And, and again, this is such a common thread through the founding fathers of America who, who said, you know, at last we're ready for self-government. We're going to throw off the shackles of tyranny, um, but we have to keep God central to absolutely everything. And, and so the antidote for big government is big family and, and big church. And I'm going to conclude with a quote from... Somebody who is quite often right and not always, and that's the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he said this about the church. The church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state, never its tool. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal and cease to be an echo of the status quo, it will be relegated to an irrelevant social club with no moral or spiritual authority. If the church does not participate actively in the struggle for peace and justice, it will forfeit the loyalty of millions and cause men everywhere to know that it is an institution whose will is atrophied. But if the church will free itself from the shackles of a deadening status quo and, recovering its great historic mission, will proceed to speak and act fearlessly and insistently on the questions of justice and peace, it will enkindle the imagination of mankind. It will fire the souls of men and imbue them with a glowing and ardent love for truth, justice and peace. Men far and near will then see the church as that great fellowship of love which provides light and bread for lonely travellers at midnight. May the church recover its will and its mission as salt and light in the state. Thank you. Well, thank you to Graham Hood, to Dave Pello, to Stephen Shavura, and to Pastor Matthew Littlefield. We'll give one more round of applause, please. You guys can take a seat. 
and uh, thank you to David Pello of Church and State for those closing remarks and uh, for bringing your wonderful conference here to Albury.